cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Hans, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Yeah, it's uh, kind of rainy and yucky and nasty out there today. It sure is. Typical uh, Oregon winters. <laughs> that is true. Uh, can I pour us a little bit of wine to kind of start off with? Please do. Okay. You know, so this, you know, I always kind of start off with a blind wine to uh, kind of get things moving forward. You can say something about it if you want to. Sure. Um, it's totally up to you. Zero pressure cool. uh, to comment or, or anything. So Cool. And then at the end... I will reveal what it is, and uh, you know, we'll have a little bit of fun with it. Sounds good. All right. Well, definitely notice off right off the bat some uh, deep color. So I'm not sure we're in uh, Pinot country with this wine. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, definitely some dark fruit flavors, rich, night. Oak, very present, nicely integrated, but certainly present. Right. Yeah, delicious. Very good. Thank you for sharing. Of course, yes. Um, And it's always fun to to share. I try to find something that might relate to you a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. So we'll see if I hit the nail on on the head or not. Well, this definitely strikes me as a new world, you know, Bordeaux style wine. Um, Have a lot of experience with those from my days down in California. And if I were to hazard a guess, there is a sort of like a olive tapenade note on there that uh, makes me think uh, Washington Bordeaux rather than California Bordeaux, but... No, that, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. All right, well, we'll see what it is yeah. here in just a little bit. Um, I know we talked about this a little bit, you know, while I was setting up, mm-hmm. but you moved from California to Oregon in 2016, and from our talks earlier, it sounds like you're still kind of adjusting to the um, the Oregon rains quite a bit. Yeah, this is true. Uh, the, the California sunshine still appeals to me very much, but... Um, Everything else about Oregon is is just lovely. It is. It is. It is absolutely lovely. And you know, growing up in California, you know, you wanted to, if I remember correctly, you wanted to kind of be a chef. Yeah. Right. That was your passion. And I'm just kind of curious, why did that that fizzle away? And then, do you still kind of dabble in that area a little bit these days? Yeah. So when I was little, I um, I loved food. I loved going out to eat. Um, it was always, you know, a big treat in our family to go out. And when I was little, um, I stopped asking for, you know, birthday parties. Instead, I wanted to go out and uh, just go to a fancy meal somewhere locally. Um, and in Santa Cruz, there's no shortage of nice restaurants, but it isn't the hotbed of, you know, culinary exploration as some of the surrounding areas. So we started branching out and going into um, San Francisco as well, which was really eye opening for me and a ton of fun. And then my, um, my family encouraged me to help in the kitchen, which was a lot of fun. So right. from a really early age, loved cooking, loved food. When I got sort of, um, high school age, you know, other things took, uh, more of my interest in sports and girls and that sort of thing. Of course. So I, um, sort of lost the passion then. But never went away entirely, and I uh, continued to like to go out to eat when I was down in San Diego, getting my degree um, as much as my budget would allow. And then um, after college, I had the opportunity to work harvest at Napa, and it was sort of just like a stopgap, you know, whim type of decision. But I thought it would be cool to... uh, you know, see how wine was made and immerse myself in the wine and food of, you know, epicenter of the U S really. Yeah. And, and so, and, and Portland is so well known for all of its, you know, food restaurants or whatever. Do you ever, 
you know, dabble in that? Yeah, we, I don't get out as much as I'd like to. I've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old that keep me pretty tied down to home base, but right. um, we do get out, um, you know, occasionally, and I, the dining scene in Portland is fantastic. There's so much diversity, you know, it's not just classic French or Italian, you know, there's a bit of everything, which I love, you yeah. know, especially the, you know, Asian flavors really appeal to me, so sushi ramen that sort of thing that's, that's awesome uh, and i assume that you still probably dabble a little bit you know in your current kitchen with, with your family right now right? yeah definitely i definitely do the bulk of the cooking in, in the house um my wife is a fantastic cook as well but i just have a, a bit more enthusiasm for it so um mm-hmm. the uh the cookbook collection is getting a little out of hand <laughs> and the um the wife wishes i would you know Cull some of the lesser red ones, but that that'll never happen. No, no, you, you got to hold on to all of those. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Uh, speaking of food, this past summer, uh, Dusky Goose held their like twentieth anniversary, like big celebratory dinner, and I saw that and I was sad that I there was just no way I could come. Yeah, it was a great time. I I could imagine. Um, you know how. How special was it to share the spotlight, you know, with Lynn and, you know, because she is kind of one of those defining faces of of Oregon wine. Yeah, very much so. I've been very fortunate to be sort of brought into Lynn's orbit over the years um, through Dusky Goose and my wife who works for Penner Ash. Um, And it was just great, you know, to be a part of uh, Dusky Goose's transition into me taking over the winemaking and uh, just being able to, you know, share the stage and hear the stories that she and John have shared over the years. They have right. such an amazing rapport. And then that coupled with um, wines going all the way back to our debut vintage, 2002, and delicious food from Tornant. We had oysters and charcuterie and paella. It was, oh, it was fantastic. I was, I was so jealous. And I saw the pictures and I did. Ugh. I tell you what, that the schedule, right? Yeah. Why does it have to get in the way so much? Yeah. Well, there's only so many uh, events one can attend, and I think that we were, you know, one of a handful of really appealing events on that on that exact day. So. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Um, and I can only imagine. I mean, the like the legacy that Lynn Pinarash has already, you know, kind of set. Uh, you know, and so both you and your wife are following in those footsteps. Mm-hmm. Do you ever kind of like pinch yourself and wonder, is this is this real? Is this really happening? I mean, it- well, we're we're certainly very grateful to her and trusting you know her legacy projects with us, and you know we don't want to disappoint her in any way. And, right. And fortunately, we still have her ear, and she's you know very much willing to help in uh, however she can, whether it's, you know, helping with uh, vineyard decisions um, yeah, or the blending process, which she's still is a, a big part of uh, right. for Dusky Goose in particular. Yeah. And, and so your, your journey to kind of Dusky Goose, I mean, you were at uh, Carlton Winemaker Studio for a period of time with That's Andrew right. Rich. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the reason that you're up here in Oregon is because your wife was an intern at, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking off the Bethel Heights, Bethel Heights. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, talk to Ben Castell, you know, Hey, if anything comes up, you know, let me know. And eventually in, you know, a position came open, you know, at, at Pinner Ash. Yep. And so that's kind of what brought you up here into Oregon. And during that time with you were at Andrew Rich, you know, you got to kind of taste in, you know, some of the, the round tables with your wife and Lynn Pinnerash. It's just, uh, it's absolutely all inspiring. And all I can say is, wow. I mean, just, I, I can't even imagine being in your shoes. Yeah, I was incredibly lucky. Um, you know, my wife is an amazing winemaker and she, in 2010, had never held a full-time position at a winery before, but had done a lot of harvests abroad and domestically. And she's a, a native Oregonian and always um, really wanted to wind up in the Willamette Valley. So she fell in love with the the Bethel Heights wines, the whole Castile family told Ben, like if ever a uh, assistant winemaker position comes, I'll be here right. in a moment. And 
the job never materialized, and Lynn had just um, finalized the deal with Jackson family, and part of the deal was she got to pick out her successor. So she started talking to her most trusted uh, winemaker friends in the Valley, and Ben said, I'm, I'm loath to give this person up, but she's been, you know, telling me for years that she wants to get up here. Right. And we had been, in, I had been in Napa for uh, 10 years at that point. My wife had been there for five and we loved our community, the wines, everything, but we really had been jonesing to get up to the, to the Willamette Valley for a long time. So when the, we jumped at the opportunity right. and uh, I was incredibly fortunate that I was able to find a position with um, Andrew Rich so that I didn't, you know, sit unemployed for a while. Right. Um, but that was also uh, thanks to, to Lynn. Uh, Andrew had just lost his assistant winemaker who had been working with him for, I think, uh, 13 years or something. Wow. And he reached out to Lynn and said, hey, do you know of anybody good available? And she said, well, as it happens, I don't know this person, but you should talk to him. I know he's coming up to the Valley and I know he's got a winemaking background. So that was that. That worked out. That's, that is absolutely amazing how life just kind of happens that way yeah yeah it, it really is and i honestly i could not have asked for a better place to cut my teeth in the willamette valley than the carlton winemaker studio there's so many amazing winemakers there so not only did i get to work with andrew who's who's incredible but i got to see the winemaking of so many other folks you know you did and kind of on that on that topic um and working with so many different people you know um Again, before the before you know we started recording, we were talking about Isabel. Mm-hmm. I'm just I'm just kind of curious. Did you learn any like? Absolutely. Yeah. No, everyone is so giving with their knowledge and time. Um, Andrew Rich and Isabel shared a large uh, one of the fermentation decks at the studio, so we were you know bumping into each other constantly during harvest, and you know once I had a pretty my mind wrapped around Andrew's process, then it was time to, you know, absorb what I could from everybody else there. And right. Isabel is, she's a, a fantastic teacher and she's famous for her daily tastings of all the fermenters. And she's, you know, willing, she does that with her team, obviously, but then she's uh, happy to bring in whoever else wants to join them. So sitting in on those tastings and just learning her philosophy and seeing her winemaking has been incredible. And I, I love her wines. Yeah, no, they, they are amazing. I won't forget uh, when I talked to Peyton West and, you know, his wife, Jessica, last summer. Uh, one of the things that Peyton took away from Isabel was Chardonnay is a journey. Sure. You know, and it's kind of the exact opposite of Pinot. And you just like do all your magic. But Chardonnay is just this, this marathon that it just constantly evolves. And you kind of got to babysit a little bit. So that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I... If anyone has, you know, a philosophy worth, you know, diving into on Chardonnay, it's Isabel. She's produced a lot of really incredible ones over the years. Yeah. And uh, Chardonnay at Dusky Goose is something that I'm really excited about because it's a grape that I haven't worked with prior to Dusky Goose since 2010 when I was working for Cake Bread. And Cake Bread makes a fantastic Chardonnay, but we were, you know, making 100,000 cases of it right. as opposed to our little, you know, 300 cases. It, it's, a little, it, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. But I must say, in retrospect, I am in awe of the, the quality and attention that Cake Bread was able to give to those wines on that scale that really a well-run operation over there. Yeah, and if I remember the origin story of Chardonnay here at Dusky Goose, mm-hmm. uh, the owners were like, you know, we want a Chardonnay, but Lynn Pinarash was like, I'll never make a Chardonnay. Yeah, she is a big Chardonnay hater. It continues to be. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah she refused to do it at Pinarash. She refused to do it for Dusky Goose, and eventually... Um, John and Linda, the owners of Dusky Goose, wore her down. Right. And in 2014, they produced their first bottling off of the Fenwood Vineyard, which John um, owned up until 2019. And um, it, it's been so well received by our customers yeah. that uh, the, the program has grown in the last few years. And we've added vineyard sites. And it's a, 
and also at Penner Ash, as soon as she sold the winery, they started making Chardonnay there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, why right. not? Right. Yeah. And she makes amazing Chardonnay. It's just not her favorite thing to consume. Right, no, and that, that's understandable. Oh, outside of the Carlton wine, at the Carlton winemaker studio, mm-hmm. outside of Isabel, mm-hmm. oh, you know, is there somebody else that like stands out as just like a rock star? Well, Anthony King, who uh, makes his label Ratio and then consults for Asilda and Guillen and a handful of other, you know, small producers there. He's just a wealth of information and the most giving person of his time and advice. He, he's, he's really incredible. And his um, approach to winemaking is so methodical and thoughtful that it's, it's pretty inspiring in that way. Right. And he, you know, he's a scientist um, by training, and so he he brings that very analytical approach to it. And then, um, you know, when Peterson Nedry was also a ton of fun to see. She gets to work with such amazing sites with their, you know, their Ridgecrest Vineyard, which is so beautiful and historic, and yeah. you know, they have such a a long tradition of making wine here in the valley that it, it's cool to see her. Um, cause she's been doing it. I mean, she's not old by any means, but she's been doing it for so long oh, that it's just so, um, natural and it just kind of, it seems like it comes to her, you know, second nature, which is, it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And I'm, uh, this year I think was the first vintage that she's working with Arlen mm-hmm. and I, I cannot wait to see what she produces. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, there's always a learning curve when you're starting with a new site, but yeah, those wines are going to be incredible, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, she does a great job. Yeah. Um, if I were if I was to ask your wife who's a better winemaker, you or her, what would she say? She would probably say her, and she would be right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the better cook. That's true. That's true. I don't know what. She, yeah, she would probably say that as well. Um, if you had absolutely zero constraints, right? You could like work with any grape varietal like just to experiment and play with you know is there is there anything in particular that kind of stands out to you well that's a tough question because there's so many layers to it there's you know there's wines that i love to consume you know like barolo but you can't you can't make barolo without Nebbiolo from Piedmont, so that's kind of off the table. Well, no, z- zero constraints. You don't, don't, don't worry about it. You could just, if you could just do anything. Uh, well, making Barolo would be pretty darn fun. I'm okay. also currently on a, a bit of a Chenin Blanc kick, so if I could work with Chenin Blanc from the Loire, or, I don't know. I'm optimistic for Chenin Blanc in the Willamette Valley as well. There's right. just not a lot of it planted. Lynn um, has some that she's planted. I know, and yeah. I'm super excited for it. I think that she got like maybe a ton this year but you know yeah. when it comes online that's going to be super cool it will be i think i think this was the first year that it came online mm-hmm. yeah and then you know i i did it for 10 years and napa valley cabernet still holds a special place in my heart i love those wines I, it, the best examples can be really transcendent right and so if i could you know get some spring mountain primo Cabernet trucked up here to play with. That would be pretty fun. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. Oh, one of the kind of popular things that are, that's kind of happening in the Willamette Valley is, you know, sparkling. Mm-hmm. Do you have any interest of even dipping your toe into that? I, I am cautiously optimistic about the possibility of Dusky Goose doing that. It's, right. um, it's something I don't like to get into things I don't like to set myself up for failure. Of course. Of so, course. you know, things right. like that where I don't have the background, I'm, I tend to be kind of hesitant for. Well, you got to be cautious. Yeah. Right, right, right. But I do love sparkling wine and the wine, the sparkling wine being made in the valley is just getting better and better. You know, I still think that it's got a ways to go to, to measure up to, to, to France, but, you know, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. So right. in, a hun- in hundreds of years, I expect... Uh, We'll be making something just as good, if not better. And and I completely agree. I mean, uh, I think we're not even bare, we're we're at the cliff edge of the cliff, right? Of 
you know, maybe getting some older vintages of, of sparkling. Exactly. Right. Uh, you know, so like Lytle Barnett, I think they started in 2012. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, you got to put in uh, Argyle in, into that picture and other places. But, uh, you know, give us, you know, another 15 you know, some odd years and we'll get, you know, get some nice reserve wine in there. I think it's going to be quite special. Yeah. Well, so we have, um, a consultant here at Dusky Goose, uh, Chris Kalina, and he was, a uh, um, a big part of the success at Argyle on the sales side. So he's right. definitely been in my ear to start making <laughs> sparkling and like, right. and I'm like, well, I don't know how to do it. And yeah. He said, well, you the only one way to learn and just go for it. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, Hayden West, you know, is now the winemaker at Benza, and mm-hmm. he's now dabbling in into sparkling. So that's well, and he fun. fortunately has Jess, who's been doing it for a little while, to right. to help him along, which is which is great for them both. It, it is great, you know. But you know, I you know, I think you could probably talk to them a little bit. Oh, sure. He actually, yeah. I can see his house from my house. He lives right around the corner. So. But there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just get together and. Just have a nice little session. I think over the summer, you know, there was a bunch of winemakers that got together at Harper Voigt and mm-hmm. it was a big old Grenache tasting, which was quite interesting to, to yeah. see the the end result of that. That would have been quite a fun experience. Grenache, you say? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, we played, Andrew played with that a little bit. Um, well, he did for many, many years, um, but only a couple years while I was working for him. But Andrew's um, real passion in wine is uh, the Rhone. And so when he came up to the Willamette Valley from uh, from Santa Cruz, he was at Bonnie Dune. Right. His whole goal was to try to emulate Chateauneuf Ooh. up here. But he, he quickly realized that um, the grape varieties required to produce that weren't really planted even in Washington. Right. So uh, he pivoted and did Pinot and Bordeaux varieties and all sorts of different stuff. But... Over the years, he did get some really incredible Syrah sites and Grenache, Maved, right? all the things. He does a lot of fun stuff. He sure does. Yeah, yeah. No, I, when I go to the studio, I'm like, all right, so what, what does he have? Yep. Uh, he, uh, over the summer, again, over the summer, I got some uh, Pinot from the Bednarak uh, mm-hmm. vineyard, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh. I was That's great. a really cool site. It is. I've, I've heard amazing things. You know, I know that he has some Martin Woods, 100 Sons. Project, yeah, Project M. M. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. It, it was one of, it was always, you know, in one sense, it was kind of a pain cause it's way the hell out there by, right. um, by the reservoir and, you know, so it, it was a, a challenge to stay on top of and sample and everything, but I was always more than willing to go out there just cause once you got there, it was so peaceful and so gorgeous. Just these old unrooted pomard vines that I don't know. It was lovely. Yeah. It's uh, Renee from Hundred Sons, you know, kind of went in and told me about it. And mm-hmm. uh, it's, it, it's still on my little bucket list to, to get out there. And, you know, specifically. I know that Project M does periodic uh, vineyard tours out there. Okay. Yeah. It might just be once a year or something, but, um, and Jerry's a super cool guy. Yeah. He does seem like he'd be a very super cool guy. I haven't talked to him yet, but it's, I'm, it's getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you have like a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. Mm-hmm. Your wife is a winemaker. Mm-hmm. Just dive a little bit into like what in the world does harvest look like for you guys? Well, we are very fortunate to have um, family support. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. Right. Um, this last year, my uh, stepmom and father moved in with us for the month of October, which was you know the crux of harvest this right. year. And that, you know, is that's what made it happen for us. They were there in the mornings to get the kids off to daycare, pick them up from daycare. Uh, my stepmom cooked for us every night. And then on the weekends, they watched them all day. So, wow. yeah. That's it amazing. took a tremendous amount of pressure off of us. And then in years past, um, my mother-in-law has uh, borne the brunt of the, uh, the child care duties, especially right. on the weekends. Um, But yeah, we just make it work and one of us goes in super early and one of us comes home super late, typically, that sort of thing. Well, you got a tag team and, you know, Mm -hmm. it it all takes a a big old village. That's right. Um, Do you know who Josh McDaniels is from Flitzel McDaniel? Sure. Yeah, no, we get get Chardonnay from from Cooley. 
Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Nice. <laughs> um, he, so he was 16 and he started his own winery, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's ambitious. <laughs> it was. Oh, but I can imagine, you know, your two kids are in this whole setup and uh, very much have, you know, influence, you know, of the wine community and whatnot. Yeah. So my question is, uh, how do you uh, handle if one of your when your children come up to you at the age of 16 and say that, you know, they want to start a winery? Um, well, I don't, it's hard to say not, I mean, not really knowing what kind of kids they're going to be in well, I, I, 13 I, I know, years, but, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful industry to be a part of that said, my wife and I are funny in that, um, we have no desire to do our own thing. We are more than happy to work for other folks. We get to get our, our jollies out creatively right. working for other folks and let them, you know, reap the rewards, but also take the risk of, of the products that we produce. So I might caution them in that way, but at the same time, if they're really passionate about it, I would say, yeah, do yeah. it. No, well, that is cool. Um, and I know that they're super young. I think you said one in three. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking, you know, down the road of kind of like what a legacy would that would that what you're trying to set for them? Is that I think in? not so much from a wine perspective. I mean, hopefully that they, you know, enjoy the what we produce, but um, that's not a huge priority. You know, they'll grow into their own people, and I just want to support them in however you know they you know, they want to be supported. Right. No, I, I, I get it. So I have, a, I have a 14 year old daughter. Uh, and you know, like she's big time into ballet. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do ballet f four nights a week and, uh, you know, there's homework and then there's, she just got invited to do another performance over the spring. So that's going to be even more. And I, it's at three, I would have never had any clue right. that we'd be, knee deep into uh, into all the ballet and and she's currently big time into anime and i'm like i never would have seen that coming mm -hmm. you know so i i know it's an unfair question you know but it was just i i always um ever since i talked to andy lytle last year you know just the legacy just is always in the back of my head yeah i mean i think honestly the things that they're going to get pressured into more from both of us are things like um, sports, you know, just being active, having outlets outside of, you know, school and your general day to day, you know, we were both, my wife and I were both, uh, athletes through high school and into college and, you know, music is important to us. Just a lot having diverse interests, whatever they, you know, happen to be, right. um, being a, a cycling enthusiast myself, I will definitely, pressure them to get out on the mountain bike with me. But, right. you know, um, I also know that the best way to deter them from doing that is to pressure them into doing it. So I try to use a light hand. Right. No, that's, that's cool. So have you found some good mountain bike trails? Since yeah. You yeah. There's lots of great mountain biking trails in, in Oregon. You know, there's, um, the Oak Ridge area has incredible mountain biking outside of Portland, Hood River. Right. Um, locally there's a little bit of mountain biking, but it's, um, like unsanctioned trail type of things. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, we, we talked about biking a teeny bit. I, I like to do cycle Oregon, mm -hmm. you know, week long, 500 mile road cool. biking. Um, and you know, they're starting to like bring in gravel, mm -hmm. right? Have you done any gravel biking? I haven't. I'm, I'm strictly gravity based. Right. Um, I, I suffer the ups to enjoy the downs and, that, we that's all? that's my uh, right. that's my personality. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I enjoy the ups, you know, for the downs as well. I love, you know, going down a hill at like fifty miles an hour and just like yes, <laughs> please don't let the car come out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I totally understand, you know, suffering through the ups. Yeah. Um. You you've been nice and integrated into the Oregon wine community, you know, through your wife and through the Carlton Winemaker Studio and now Dusky Goose. And uh, is there any like one or two stories that really stick out to you of, you know, the collaboration, you know, of the Oregon wine community? Sure. I mean, 
one in particular, it's a it's a tragic story, but Jesus Guillen of uh, White Rose and Guillen Wines passed away a few years ago. And just watching the way the community rallied around its family to keep the brand afloat, making wine, you know, when he passed away right before harvest. Right. So Anthony King in particular stepped in in a major way there, um, has since taken on that project but you know i i helped a little bit coming in and you know just driving the forklift and shuffling barrels now and again because anthony right. was making his own wine making his clients wine and then right. volunteering his time to make jesus's wine as well so yeah i mean that was that was pretty special to see and then you know the um the 2020 vintage being the challenge that it was just seeing the the pooling of resources mental resources to try to get everyone's mind wrapped around that very specific and rare problem you know in the Willamette Valley was really impressive because it's it sort of I mean to this day it's a problem that there's no silver bullet fix for no one no one knows what to do or how to approach it or what you know what the right approach is but right. everyone was so collaborative and forthcoming with well, so this is what I heard from so-and-so in Australia where they deal with fires all the time or right. so-and-so in Anderson Valley where they deal with fires occasionally. So that was that was pretty incredible. That, that is incredible. And, um, yeah, I mean, the, in 2017 when um, the Tubbs fire in, uh, like, Santa Rosa was happening, uh, Fela was making wine at the studio. So their assistant winemaker, um, who lived in Santa Rosa and whose house was threatened, was getting calls from his wife about, you know, uh, we're evacuating, and he's just at the studio, you know, doing punch downs, right. and like, eventually he's like, I gotta get the hell out of here. I yeah. got, I gotta go, you know, yeah, that, that's... I could be with my family, and then, you know, fortunately the the studio was able to step in there and take over things, but it's um. Yeah, everyone just is pulling for everyone else. It's great. And it's a, you know, rising tides lifts all boats sort of mentality here in Oregon. Yeah, no, most most definitely. Uh, kind of going back to the studio, uh, are you still making wines at the studio for Dusky Goose? Or do you get that the new facility is completely online? Yeah, so we, um, Dusky Goose moved out of Penner Ash in 2020 after the 2020 vintage was bottled. So in 21, we made our wines at the studio and saw them through bottling there. Right. And then in 21, right before harvest, John and Linda purchased a production facility in Carlton just down the road. And so it was essentially a turnkey operation when it was purchased. Um, it had been operating as a winery before. Um, we could have just stepped right in and started making wine, but we were under contract at the studio. Um, I had been at the studio so long that it was actually kind of a nice transition for me. We're just kind of taking one, you know, element of change out of the equation. Right, right. And so, and it gave me a, an opportunity to have an entire year to get the new facility. Although it was turnkey, there was there was things to be done, and so um, it gave me a year to get situated there and get our licensing all set up and right. so uh yeah now we are currently all of our production is done at um uh 213 north yam hill street in carlton congratulations thank you yeah, yeah it's a ton of fun to have my own space and uh, <laughs> uh an ample amount of it <laughs> right and you work on your own timeline you don't have to overlap with everybody so that's exactly yeah no that's that is that is nice congratulations thank you thank yeah. you uh, so I have some rapid fire questions and rip. then we can reveal what the wine is. Cool. Okay. Uh, favorite artist to listen to during harvest. Ooh, changes from year to year. I think this last year we were listening to a lot of, um, gosh. So Celeste, my intern was mostly in charge of, uh, DJ responsibilities. Right. And, um, there was a band that was new to me that we listen to a bunch and it's, I'm blanking on it right now, but, uh, normally it's, it's something pretty energetic. Um, we're, we're on the sorting line. It can be tedious. We're right. trying to keep spirits high. So, you know, it could be James Brown or, 
journey or, you Something know, that has some, some good, some good vibes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bob Marley, definitely a lot of Bob Marley. Okay. Nice. Nice. Uh, favorite indulgent food. Ooh. Um, I would say like lamb shanks. I really love lamb and right. like a braised lamb shank on a day like today oh, certainly be, hits the spot for me. That would be great. Um, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Hmm. Gosh. I'm just going to go down the middle and flight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, harvest notes. Are they digital or handwritten? Handwritten. Okay. Favorite superhero? Um, growing up, it was Wolverine. Yeah. Oh, uh, have you heard that Wolverine is coming back? For I did like not. Deadpool three. No. Yeah. That's exciting. Is it going to be um, um, what's his name? The, the Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. Yep. It is. Yep. It's cool. Hugh Jackman coming back as Wolverine. That's awesome. Obviously, in the timeline, it's before Wolverine passes away. But yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's super fun. I used to love comic books, but I mostly liked them for the illustrations. I was less attached to the storylines, which is kind of weird. I would I would no. find a uh, uh, an artist that I really liked and I would buy all of their comic books regardless of who was in them. And that's kind of how my daughter is about anime. Mm-hmm. I mean, she likes all the stories, but you know, and at some point she'll, you know, she'll pause and she's like, look at that. Look at the detail that they're doing there. And like, look at the facial expression. Right. And she's all about the, the illustrations. Cool. Uh, last book you read. Um, I'm currently reading Cannery Row by Steinbeck. Okay. It's a ton of fun. And we were just down in uh, Monterey and uh, on Cannery Row, so it inspired me to go back to that one. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, shall I reveal what the wine is? Yes, please. Okay. You know, so I didn't, I, I know that you like a little bit, you know, of the heavier wines. Mm-hmm. So I knew I couldn't bring a peanut. I mean, I knew I could, but that's not... Your, your heart is in Pinot, but like your foundation, right? So I uh, went with the oh, look at that. 09 Andrew Rich uh, Columbia Valley Syrah. Oh, good job, Andrew. That's yeah. delicious. Yeah. That's super fun. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, yeah. You know, you're most welcome. Prometheus. Yeah, that's um, that's a fun one. I think, well, when, when I was making it with Andrew. It was a blend of red willow and um, Clos de Cheval, sorry, Ciel de Cheval vineyards. Uh, and it was always one of my favorites. I don't know what, if it was working with the same sites at the time, but. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Would well, you have any other questions or anything else that you'd like to cover? No, I think that was, thanks for coming. That was a ton of fun.